Good morning. My name is Timothy Dykstra, and I welcome you to our worship service. At the Church of Nativity, we believe all people are of sacred worth. We warmly welcome people of every age, language, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, physical and mental ability, economic means, marital status, and family structure into the full fellowship, membership, leadership, ministry, worship, and sacramental life of our congregation. As a loving and inclusive faith community, we welcome seekers, doubters, and believers. As we in the United Church of Christ, no matter who you are or where on life's journey you are, you are welcome here. Reverend Scott Thomas will now offer announcements for this morning. Morning, church. Can you believe it snows in January in Buffalo? Go figure. Uh, welcome to our service of worship here at the Mighty Church of the Nativity. All of you who are here in our sanctuary, all of you who are here with us on live stream, we are one body of Christ and we are glad to be together in worship. Um, let's see, lots of uh, folks participating in worship today. Our wonderful chancel choir is here under and Stevens' direction. Um, Debbie Kamarowski's ushering team has um, running things for the month of January. Tim Dykstra is our liturgist today. And up running the AV, I see Don Oswald, Dan Hess, Ed Buminis, and their support staff. So thanks to all of those folks for being, uh, being part of the worship today. Um, you have nativity notes. You have more than enough information to keep you occupied. Um, Note, we will, we will today dedicate some gifts for the baby Jesus, which is a, a church tradition here, but you have a couple more Sundays to bring those, those uh, gifts for Harvest House, so please be aware of that. I ask you also to um, make a special point of being here on the 28th, a few Sundays from now, for our congregational meeting. The carrot uh, for that is there's lunch that follows, um, but really an important part of the self-governing congregational church of which we grow out of. So um, please do uh, plan to be here for that. If you have not responded to an email that you should have gotten, um, asking you to answer a few questions uh, called the Welcoming Diversity Inventory, really important that you do that so that we um, can move forward with the posting of the church profile. Um, so dig, dig that up and finish that up if you would. Um, if you uh, have a little few minutes after worship today, stick around. We're gonna take down all these beautiful Christmas decorations and really get into the meat of the year, but many hands will make light work for that. And then finally, I've been asked to uh, just call your attention to the blood drive that happens this coming Saturday here at Nativity. If you've got a little extra blood that you want to get rid of, this is where you can do that. I think that's what we need to say. Um, let's be together in an attitude of expectancy. Can't wait to see what the Spirit of Christ will move among us this morning.
Let us read together the call to worship. Give glory to the Creator and bow in holy splendor. Give glory to the Holy One and bow in holy splendor. The voice of the Holy One redeems and restores. Give glory to Christ, the living water, and bow in holy splendor. The voice of the living water refreshes and revives. Glory to God. Please be seated. Let us together confess our sins. Holy One, we cast our needs for grace and mercy. We seek forgiveness for times we have drawn away from you and our neighbors. We lament the ways we participate in the systems of the world and oppose your holy realm. Transfer us, we pray, to be carriers and promoters of your good news, news of new life, liberation, and hope in the world. Amen. And I invite us all into just a brief time of silent confession. these words of assurance, the God of peace is faithful to offer forgiveness and new life in Christ. So receive the good news of new mercies with each new day and a future with hope. Amen. Please do be seated. Now, you may have seen as the chancel choir processed this morning that they walked in the footsteps of the wise men from the east, bringing gifts. And it is a nativity tradition of long standing that we walk in the footsteps of the Magi by bringing gifts to the infant Jesus. And a baby, this baby, of course, was born a homeless refugee in a time of great oppression. A reminder that God seeks out the least and the lost. And a reminder that we can be part of God's work through uh, offerings like this. And so this morning we want to bless these epiphany gifts. This is just a little little sample. There's a pile of them. Uh, Many of them came uh, from a generous donation from the Kenton YMCA we want to raise up as well the people at Harvest House where these gifts will go next. And just a little bit about Harvest House, they have a base down on Jefferson Avenue and they provide health care for working poor people. They do a lot of workplace, uh, I'm sorry, workforce development education to help people climb out of poverty. And they really have a big strong baby and children's ministry that every year serves more than 5,000 kids living in poverty. Clothing, diapers, all sorts of supports for those families. Really a wonderful ministry, and that is where our support is going today. So I would ask that you join me in responsibly a litany of blessing as we send these gifts out into the world. There it is. One more slide will get us there. (laughs) As the Magi brought gifts to lay before the Christ child, we raise these gifts to Christ 
God's care. And in these gifts, may children and families in need know that they are God's beloved. Out of all souls, we pray that you would bless these offerings of comfort and hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we begin a two-part series of messages on the Old Testament book of Proverbs. And so today, it is my job to convince you that the Old Testament book of Proverbs matters, okay? That it makes a difference to us as Christians, and that it has some practical wisdom that might mean something to the way we live our lives. Because wisdom is what we are after here, right? So along with Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon and the book of Job, Proverbs is part of the biblical canon called wisdom literature. And these books are different from the rest of the Bible because they represent the very best of human wisdom. Read Proverbs and you will find there a distillation of generation after generation of human experience. And if we're lucky, as we travel through life, well, we gain wisdom from our experiences, right? Live and learn, right? And in Proverbs, there is a way to speed up that process. Because in this book, we have live and learn to the nth degree. We have the benefit of generations of faithful people who've gone before us and who've tested it out and have discovered what works, what doesn't. And then somebody smart gathered up all of these principles into one neat package. And if you open your Bible, you can find it there right after Psalms, right? So you might resist the idea that this ancient wisdom can be of any use to us. 
And certainly the lessons of our own experience, well, those run deep, right? First time somebody scams you out of some money or first time you hurt someone you love by doing something stupid, you learn something. And that's how wisdom builds up in our lives. That's how if we're smart and if we're living intentionally and not just letting the world happen to us, that's how we're not just getting older, we're getting some kind of better. But to have the wisdom of the ages laid out for us in 31 neat chapters, that takes some getting used to. Somebody presents me with the wisdom of the world, I tend to think, well, I'll, I'll learn that myself, thank you very much. If you've ever tried to give advice to a teenager, you know how that goes, right? And beside that kind of default position of mine of question authority, I think we might wonder whether these words written so many centuries ago, whether they can make sense in our own time. And a lot of the Bible definitely makes sense, right? I mean, the stories of Jesus um, make a difference for us because we, of course, believe that Jesus continues to be present with us in the person of the living Christ. But these Old Testament words, they're probably compiled about five centuries before Jesus' birth. They're the wisdom of a fairly des a primitive desert and agrarian culture. Well, you know, that's not us. How can this have any use for us? Why bother reading Proverbs? So to answer that question, I want to look at something that happened on the day that the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded. January 28th, 1986. Maybe you remember where you were when you heard that news, if you were alive. For me, that event is all tied up with the birth of our son Jeremy, who was 11 days old at that point and keeping us up at night. The space shuttle was 74 seconds into its flight when it exploded, killing the seven astronauts aboard. The story first hit the news wire eight minutes later. And this was a major disaster, of course, for the space program, and it meant trouble for the four contractors that had been part of the Challenger launch. Rockwell International, which built the shuttle and its main engines. Lockheed, which managed ground support. Martin Marietta, which made the ship's external fuel tank and Martin Thiokol, which built the solid fuel booster rocket, boosted it up. And there was hell to pay on the stock market. 21 minutes after that explosion, Lockheed stock was down 5%, Martin Marietta's was down 3%, Rockwell was down 6%. But by the end of the trading day, the stock of those three companies had rebounded. They all ended the day down about 3%, so not great, but not disastrous. But for Morton Thiokol, the news was not so good. So many investors tried to dump that stock, that trading in the stock was halted for a little while, and at the close, Martin Thiokol had fallen by 12%. And what's amazing about this, to me at least, is that at this point, no one knew what had caused the disaster. It wasn't until six months later that a presidential com commission came to the conclusion that the shuttle exploded, you remember, because the O-ring seals on the booster rockets had gotten brittle in the cold weather and gases leaked out that burned into the main fuel tank and caused the explosion. And as I said, this determination took six months to make. But by the end of the very day of the disaster, the stock market that collected wisdom of thousands, maybe millions of investors had figured out that Morton Thiokol was responsible. So I tell this story as evidence for the idea that there is wisdom in numbers. Wisdom of crowds, it has been called. Much of the book of Proverbs has traditionally been attributed to King Solomon, son of King David and famous in the Bible for being terrifically wise. You remember, cut the baby in half, right? 
But scholars have shown that in fact, this book is a compilation of principles and sayings that draw widely across many cultures, including ancient Egyptian culture, interestingly. And so if you tend to be suspicious about wisdom from a single source, probably don't want to believe everything Lester Holt tells you, or anybody else for that matter. If you're suspicious of that kind of wisdom, you might want to be more confident that collectively, human beings will get things right. The wisdom of crowds shows up here in the book of Proverbs. It is crowdsourced, right? The wisdom there has stood the test of time and it has stood the test of millions of human lives that have lived it. Human nature and the principles that guide human life have changed very little, I think, since Proverbs was compiled. We're still people, right? And these ideas work. Now, one of the techniques that the writer of, uh, writers plural of, of Proverbs use is personification, giving human form to abstract, abstract concepts. And it is notable, I want to just point this out, that when the writers speak of wisdom and try to personify wisdom, they do so in a female form. Wisdom is represented as an all-knowing woman. Now, if you happen to be of the womanly persuasion, I don't want you to gloat over this, because as you read Proverbs, you will discover that there are two other concepts that are personified as women, and they are a little less flattering. One is called Dame Folly, the epitome of foolish behavior. The other is simply called Loose Woman, and she is represented as luring righteous men into the path of sin. So good news, bad news for, for women, I guess, right? But this female character called Wisdom is an important figure, and she helps us, I think, to understand more fully the character of God. Because this character, Wisdom, says in the eighth chapter of Proverbs, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. That sounds a lot like the opening verses of the Gospel of John, doesn't it? Which says that God's word and the person of Jesus was with God even before God created the world. And some have looked at this personification, this person of wisdom, and seen evidence of the Trinity, God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, all of them present from the beginning of time. And so when Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will guide us, even when Jesus is no longer physically present with us, well, there is a sense in which the Holy Spirit is that spirit of wisdom. There's this through line from the Hebrew Scriptures right through the Gospels where Jesus announces that. So next week, we will look more specifically at the way the writers of Proverbs present these principles of human wisdom. But I want to just end up today by giving you a sampling of some of the advice from this wonderful book. And you see that it is great writing. It is descriptive, evocative, pithy. It is even funny sometimes. So listen for the word of God in these couple of verses. Proverbs 13 and 11. Wealth hastily gotten will dwindle, but those who gather little by little will increase it. 11.22. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without good sense. 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word Stirs up anger. You've heard that one, right? Really works, right? Um, Fifteen seventeen. Better is a dinner of vegetables where love is than a fatted ox and hatred with it. Twenty six fourteen. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a lazy person in bed. 
47:19 Just as water reflects the human face, so one human heart reflects another. Proverbs 16:31 One of my favorites as I get older, gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. <laughs> 2224, make no friends with those given to anger, and do not associate with hotheads, or you may learn their ways and entangle yourself in a snare. 1722, a cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a downcast spirit dries up the bones. And finally, one that I try to remember when I don't know the answer, Proverbs 1728. Even fools who keep silent are considered wise. When they close their lips, they are deemed intelligent. <laughs> well, I will close my lips now, but <laughs> I simply commend to you this wonderful book of the Bible. And if you have a few minutes this week, you might just want to dip into it, sample around a little bit. It's bite-sized in so many ways, and so it, it makes for great bedtime reading for, for one thing. But know that God's Spirit, as it does throughout the Scripture, God's Spirit speaks to us in every word. And so may God's Spirit be with you as together we explore this book. Amen. Well, let's bow before God in prayer this morning. God, on this Sunday when we remember and celebrate the Magi coming to kneel before the newborn king, humble us to do the same. Shake us out of our certainty, our self-assuredness, our pride, our independence, our arrogance. Help us to remember that we are your people and you are our God and to know that Christ is forever newborn in our lives, calling us to wonder, to reverence, and to commitment. The year stretches out before us, Lord. For some of us, that seems like a daunting prospect. Others of us look with expectation and excitement for what the year might bring. Help us to remember, we pray, that day by day, month by month, you walk with us into the future, one that is unknowable but proceeds according to your plan and invites us along for the ride. Keep us holy, we pray, or at least chasing after holiness, knowing that you call us always to a better version of ourselves. We pray that this would be the year that violence would cease in Israel and Palestine, that this is the year when Russians and Ukrainians will be able to lay down their weapons. This year, we pray, may there be peace in our homes and our communities, and may we be peacemakers in some small way to work toward that end. We pray as well for Church of the Nativity in this coming year, that we would be faithful and true to your call on our life together, and that the search would soon yield a new pastor leader for this wonderful congregation. We pray for those who will interview candidates, that they will be gifted with discernment and insight. And we pray for the candidates as well, that your Holy Spirit would open up for them the possibilities of doing great ministry here. All of this we pray in the name of the Holy One, and it is in Jesus' words that we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
God calls us to generosity as we commit our time and money to Christ's work through our church. Many people donate through our website as recurring bank transfers or by mail. Gifts also can be made using the stewardship or pew envelopes and the offering plate next to the back pew. Thank you for your faithful giving. Let us pray together the prayer of dedication. God of all, we thank you for providing in abundance and allowing us to give alongside you. We dedicate our offerings to your many names. Amen. The Holy One seated on the throne says, Behold, I make all things new. And at this table we make it so. We gather as Christ's people, black and white and Asian, gay and straight, rich and poor, old and young, hurting and whole. And we are Christ's body at the table of the Lord. So this table is open, open to all who wish to come closer to God, open to God's spirit as it moves among us. Let's pray. God, you set light into being, cast the stars in the sky, founded the evolving earth and all that dwell within it. Your power is limitless and your wisdom is great. You look upon the lowly as your most cherished creatures, and on the downtrodden you visit your presence, your grace, and the promise of eternal justice. You sent to us your own child, Jesus, who reached into unexpected places, calling women beyond the limits of their times, equipping men for nurturing love, welcoming children into your holy embrace. Dear God, you transform, you transform all that is before you so that at the touch of your grace, we are never the same. Dear God, you illumine, you bring light to all peoples, light to the nations, light into our hearts, light on your way. Dear God, we pray for your spirit, transform, illumine, Bless. Make these ordinary gifts of bread and cup into the extraordinary presence of Christ with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the Gospels tell us that on the night when our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he gathered with those closest to him for a final meal. And he took bread, ordinary bread, and he broke it, and he passed it among them, and he said, take and eat, for this is my body, broken for you, and as often as you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the meal was finished, Jesus took the cup, and he blessed it, and he poured it out, and he passed it among them and said, take and drink, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. So in the broken bread, we become Christ's body in this time and place. And as we receive into our own bodies the cup of blessing, we receive the new life that Christ pours out for us again and again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. So come, for all things are now ready.
Let us pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. Holy One, we have been fed by your presence. Eternal One, we have been led by your light. May we bask in this glow now and forevermore. Amen. If you are able, remember to stay and help with the undecorating, okay? Hear then these words as we go forth. The daylight is slowly getting longer, but the light of Christ, that shines in every season. So go this week, this month, this year, live that light. Go in peace, go in joy, but most of all, go in love. Amen. Mm -hmm.